Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr, and no Christine today. Uh, explain that in a minute. But uh, our guest this week from the Queenstown Sampler Designs is Barbara Hudson. Hi, Barbara. Hi, Gary. Good to see hear, oh, well, hear you tonight. Right. Last That's time we were together, you. we saw each other at uh, the Nashville market. Oh, so. <laughs> yeah, that was a good time. Really good time. Yeah, that's a great that's a great show. Looking forward to that next year. Yes. So so we're gonna we're gonna talk reproduction samplers tonight, but uh Christine not with us and 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 it gets confusing if you're following because we record the Sunday shows with our guests, we record ahead of time. So by the time this one airs, it's quite likely that Christine will be well. The the shows that we do on Wednesday, we do the week of. And oftentimes we do them on Wednesday. Uh, so, so that's, that keeps us current, but these we do ahead of time and we're doing this one on March 27 and Christine, uh, if, if you followed had been in a car accident last week and has a concussion and it's not getting better. And I got text from her this afternoon that her, she went to the doctor and he shut her down completely. She's to do nothing for the next two or three weeks. So hopefully by the time that uh, you hear this, which will be in a couple of weeks, uh, she will be well. But um, uh, this is not getting better, and so the doctor has just completely shut her down. So she's not with us tonight, and uh, we'll see how it goes. But uh, as I've said in previous podcasts, if prayer is part of your life, Christine needs them. She's, uh, I think she got banged pretty good there. She's not uh, not doing well. So... Um, we'll count on her to heal soon, quickly. But anyway, we're going to forge on. So we have Barbara Hudson, Queen Town, Queenstown Sampler Designs. And where does the Queenstown come from? Well, I live in Queenstown, Maryland. So I thought that was a pretty good name for the, the, my company. So well, that's just, <laughs> that's just flat out creative. That must've been a long meeting, huh? <laughs> well, yeah, that was a long meeting. I also live on uh, Why Not Road, W Y E K N O T, on uh, on a little trickling of the Y River, W Y E, um, named after the same river everyone. So, the people that came over back in the uh, 1630s came to that area where the Y River in England was. So. Oh. You know, they were they they're not they they weren't very creative naming their rivers around here. So it's the same. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you know, it's, yeah. it's 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 interesting. I, I love your part of the country because of the history, and uh, we we were talking before we started recording here about how uh, I'd mentioned before my family got here from England because the uh, the British had hauled orphan boys over to fight in the Revolutionary War. And a couple of Parr brothers got brought over, and after the war, stayed. And uh, that was the beginning of our family in the U.S. And then you're, you have an interesting story with, uh, with the fact that your name is spelled with a T. Yes. Uh, my husband's family, Hudson, uh, used to spell it with a D, H-U-D-S-O-N, but in the 1840s, there, uh, they they changed it to a T because they were not happy with the Whig Party at the time. the <laughs> the The family was living in Iowa. Uh, they had some big farms there, and just outside of Devonport, and uh, they were not happy the Whigs, and so they changed it to a uh, to a T. And ever after, the part of the family that my husband came down directly from was spelled with. The, but we do have. Uh, he does have cousins that that spell it with the letter D. They live up in Idaho somewhere, but yeah, fun tracing it. I have a, a sampler, uh, Emily Hudson, uh, that is not. Oh, I'm sure somewhere down the line she's related to us. There's a, there's quite a few Hudsons in the world, but um, I haven't been able to trace her exactly to our family. So someday I'll I'll reproduce her. She's a very sweet little thing. <laughs> Oh. And yeah, there, there we go. That that a political move there. That showed him. <laughs> uh, exactly. Yeah. So I think, and that was the last time the Whigs and the Tories were uh, around. One of the parties became uh, Republican. I think I forget now my history. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I forget too. <laughs> I forget. I forget because I forget, and I forget intentionally at times too. Just mm -hmm. I got more important things to worry about. You know, <laughs> but, but it's, 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 it's it, it, it's amazing what you can find when you're looking for uh, your your family when you're looking uh, for these uh, sampler makers or any kind of ancestry you're doing. It's sometimes you find out some um, very interesting things. <laughs> Yeah, I, I got to believe that when you're doing these reproduction samplers and looking up the history, that it has to be, I, mean, I always describe it for, for me as an editor, if I have to look in the dictionary for a word, it's never just look up the word and move on. It's, you know, a half hour mm -hmm. later, I've been reading the dictionary and learning new words and definitions and so on. That's got to be like that when you look up sampler uh, history, where you just start out and it, it just doesn't end till you end it. <laughs> no, it doesn't end. Yeah, I could be researching for hours, and I'll look up, and all of a sudden it's you know three o'clock, and we never had lunch, and my husband, and poor baby, he needs his you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, come on, is it time for lunch yet? Yeah, okay, if I have to. But yeah, we I can spend hours and hours, um, and then we get si get sidetracked, and my husband calls those butterflies, and I go off on another end, and then you, and then I find things about other girls. That I'm, you know, it's 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 a good time, is what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I, my my friend, the I call her my uh, library goddess. She says I'm a closet librarian, so I have oh, okay. a good time research. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so when you yeah. do when you do this research, is it just Google searches, or do you have some favorite starting points, some websites, or something that give you a favorite starting point, or do you use the uh, those um, uh, family lineage software services. How, how do you, what's your starting point? Well, my starting point, usually I do go to, uh, directly to uh, familysearch.org, which is the uh, Church of the Latter-day Saints, uh, in conjunction with Ancestry.com. Uh, and then my local library, too. Uh, I don't pay the big buck for the uh, uh, Ancestry.com, but my, my library goddess does. Thank goodness. Because uh, if I can't find something, she will. In fact, um, I'll keep aside. This, uh, my, my friend uh, Cindy Steinhoff is the library director at a local college in Campbell County, and she can get into databases that I cannot. So I get so far with my research, and if I can't go any further, I hand it off to her, and then she just, you know, takes her minutes to find some things sometimes. Um, then... Um, so we've got family search, we've got ancestry.com, and then it does help to do a Google search, and not just Google. Um, I go to Bing because they have different um, ways of uh, looking for things, uh, different setups. So sometimes I'll find something on one that I won't find on another. Oh. And there's a third one. There's a third one I use too. And now please, it, it it's actually called dog pile d o g p i l e no yeah i've heard i've heard of that sure uh -huh. yeah <laughs> and it, it comes up with some weird things too so uh i do at least two searches on just the uh possibly the girl's name um a date an idea if i don't have uh, her age on the sampler I guess her age to be around between eight and fifteen, so I can you know and and a lot of times um or I might be getting ahead of myself, but I can usually, if I if it's a typical sampler, and I hate to say typical because there's so many kinds of samplers, but if the I can't if I can identify a motif, or I can identify a school, or I can identify a certain area of the country, or different countries too, if it's American, I have a better chance of finding her or English, um, and if uh, that's just because I don't speak other languages very well, but I have friends in other countries that do help me out, like in Germany and the Netherlands and whatnot. And Google Translate is pretty good, but not always great. Um, so um, the, uh, let's see, what other sites? Um, well, your your libra your librarian friend, you must be a godsend to your your librarian friend. She can use all of her <laughs> skills. <laughs> Oh yes, she does. Yes, she does. Uh, she's been busy uh, editing that uh, the the Delaware book that's coming out that we'll get to later. Uh, but um, yeah, she's she's uh, she's she's 
she truly is a goddess when it comes to uh, anything, any research. So, and she's helped me a lot of ways too. Um, but oh, my, your library, um, my library has an ancestry.com. Um, what do you call it? A membership. And I can do some things through my computer while I'm at home through my library but because of um, not copyright, but because of uh, terms of membership, I actually have to go to physical go to my library to look up certain uh, things in ancestry.com through my library in order to get certain information and libraries around the country uh will have that service also. So it, it, it helps. It's a really good idea to go to your library and talk to your librarian about researching uh, your, your genealogy or your sampler maker or whoever you're looking for. They're very good and very helpful. Yeah, and, and that speaks to, I, I saw something the other day about someone who had, had asked a question about how valid libraries are anymore uh, now oh that gosh. so many people use you know books on tape or whatever and you just described there's a service that uh your tax dollars at work you're able to get something mm -hmm. that that uh you'd otherwise have to pay significantly for and and uh, uh and plus oh. li librarians the skills librarians have looking things up uh, uh none of none of the rest of us have those so <laughs> <laughs> no they're, yeah. they're, i you know oh I love my library. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and well, we forget that we forget because we, we have a lot, you know, everybody has a library somewhere and we have one, we drive by it frequently and you see on the sign, uh, upcoming events and there's always two or three events. And, and usually the majority of them have to do with computers or the internet. And, and you, you if you stop and think, well, you know, there's a resource that, matches what we do today and it's in your library and uh mm -hmm. i know our our library has been for the most part completely configured uh, they've cut way back on on the number of bookshelves they have because they needed more room for computers and uh work work desks and those kinds of things for these kinds of activities and uh, um, it's just it's just a changing thing uh, along with all all the rest of us getting changed by the internet and by computers and and libraries have changed along with it and as a result they're they're a, a still an excellent resource just a different kind of resource yeah and and i i'll i'll say this too uh even though i may uh look up my uh sampler sampler makers and other things uh ahead of time while i'm reproducing a sampler up until just before i go to print I will do more research on my bill because you never know when something might something new might pop up. So, I <laughs> I'm always looking for more information on my girls. Um, someday I'm going to find a sampler that's done by a young boy that I can afford. But <laughs> usually those anymore they're going for a lot of money. The, the but, boy. Uh, the, the, so there there are samplers boys, done by boys. Oh yes, by young boys. Whether it was. Uh, well, think of it this way: they they might have been convalescing and not doing the normal things young boys do, or they might have. Uh, well, I taught my son how to how to stitch at, at a young age, and he enjoyed it. We did it as an art project, and uh, he really uh, well, he was he he was very much into painting and art and whatnot. But yeah, all of my children, I I taught uh, early. It didn't always catch on with all of them, or they went in a different direction, a different kind of craft or something. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they all knew how to uh, sew on a button, a zipper, and use a sewing machine. And In fact, oh, I need to tell you this, too. When I first met my husband, he had his own sewing machine. There he we go. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It had to be love. It had to be love at first sight. But, uh, <laughs> well, his mother was a home ec his mother was a home economics teacher too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so she there. made she made sure all her boys, and she had three of them, knew how to do that, and her daughter too. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. You wouldn't you wouldn't uh, get out of that house without knowing how to how to boil water and sew a button on. I'm sure of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so so you you have you 
obviously you've been stitching a long time then. How how do you get started? You learn from your mother or? Well, my mother was pretty busy. There were five of us children and uh, she actually went back to, uh, she, she went back to work when my youngest uh, sister was a year old and this was like 1959 and she went back to work and so my dad worked uh, second uh, uh, second shift, so that kind of worked out. And my grandmother was living with us, so my grandmother taught me how to uh, uh, to embroider, uh, freestyle type of embroidery stitches, real simple. When I was about five, maybe, but I didn't really get good at it. I was much, maybe ten years after that. Um, because I've seen some of my early work in it. <laughs> nothing to brag about. <laughs> but uh, I still have I still have a handkerchief that uh, um, I had to uh, I had to write my name in cursive, and then I had to uh, use uh, a stem stitch and, and outline the whole thing. Oh. And then my grand then my grandmother did a nice little crochet uh, attachment around the little handkerchief so i have that and i was uh, i was gonna say i knew how to do uh, i was gonna thought maybe six years old but more like seven probably but um she yeah uh, she she taught me how to crochet how to do embroidery um so i was doing a lot of embroidery in the uh 60s and 70s on my clothes and um i took a lot of classes in uh high school on uh and um, made a lot of uh, all my girls prom dresses and some wedding gowns and things like that so yeah I've been stitching a long time and every time I've tried to find during the 70s there were all kinds of different uh, uh, crafts things I did with the the children and um, so I would try different things, but I always wanted to st- go back to stitching. I always wanted to, I was happiest when I was doing any kind of embroidery, um, hmm. uh, whether it be on our clothes or on uh, um, some practical things. My grandmother always said there had to be a, something practical. You have to be able to use it. But then she was from a different generation. Too. <laughs> but she, made some, she made some very beautiful uh, um, crocheted lace. Um, tablecloths and uh, other embroidery. So my mother did know how to sew, but she was a busy woman, you know, with five kids and going back to work very early on. And so she didn't have a whole lot of time for that. Later on when I was uh, in uh, uh, junior high and in high school, and then a little bit in college, uh, she, she and I got more into embroidery uh, doing different things. And there wasn't a whole lot of visible where we were at in the Cleveland area, just outside of Cleveland. Um, and it really didn't become all that more popular. So um, I said, my husband was uh, is retired military, so uh, we did move around a little bit, not as much as some military families. But uh, we finally uh, transferred to the D.C. area, and uh, that's when um, I became more aware of different uh, historical embroideries and samplers. Um, a little bit before uh, we left, let's see, I want to say 1982, I was working at junior high at that time, um, and just as a monitor type person. I was office personnel. Um, I was in charge of uh, um, office um, oh, detentions. <laughs> oh, that, yeah, okay. Yeah, you, didn't want, you didn't want to cross Mrs. Hudson. <laughs> <laughs> She didn't give out 15-minute detentions. They, they, they were an hour. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. So a teacher, a music teacher, came in on her break time with this cute, adorable, uh, what we would call a um, Pennsylvania, some people call it Pennsylvania Dutch, which is not correct. It's Pennsylvania German a sampler kit. that She was working on 8 o'clock, and it was adorable. And she bought it at Lee Ward's. I don't know. I think maybe you uh, might remember Lee Ward's. Oh yeah. Oh, well, that's that's where uh, when I got married, we there was a Lee Ward's just down the road, and uh, a mm-hmm. lot of my early needlepoint kits and, and others. Yeah, you know, 
dimensions kits and stuff. Oh, I spent a lot of yeah. hours walking up and down those aisles. You bet. Oh, they were loaded with all kinds of things. Yeah. Yes, but they, but it wasn't would now today considered quality um, <laughs> threads and 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 and, and no. fabric. It was it was it was, but it was, it was the only game in town. There wasn't much else there. Right. Um, and that's when I got uh, got the bug again to do more embroidery and trying to find linen that my grandmother taught me how to work on um, was was difficult because uh, you had a few um, well you are in the Chicago area you had Marshall Fields you probably could go into the fabric uh, departments of some of these nicer uh, department stores at the time to find some linens but it was more for uh suits and clothing than it was for embroidery it was difficult to find embroidery fabric um at that time but anyway i'm, I'm i went off on a tangent to where were we oh yeah the the cute adorable little um sampler uh with a little um Pennsylvania, uh couple with little flowers in their hand facing each other, and then there were little compartments around. It was adorable. Uh, so I ran off to Lee Ward's and I got myself my own kit. And I proceeded <laughs> to make <laughs> And I, I, I had such a good time with this. And then, then I made uh, two more uh, one for my mother in law and one for my sister for Christmas. And I said, uh, but I, I didn't like working on the eight o'clock so much because it was so stiff and, um, yes, this was cross-stitch, but it wasn't um, exactly, you know, I, I prefer doing, uh, at the time, uh, freestyle surface, and not surface embroidery. Uh, I didn't learn raised embroidery until years after that. But, um, yeah, the uh, the uh, the cute little sampler, I have kept it so I would stay home. I have it hanging up in my, my guest room. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I, I, I came across another one. There, there there had to have been hundreds of those made. I found one in an antique store a couple of years ago locally, and uh, someone had 20 bucks on it. <laughs> so that's that's what someone thinks it's worth. I yeah. think it's worth a lot more than that because it got me going into samplers again. Uh, and once we moved to the uh, Washington, D.C. area, Annapolis area, I became more involved with uh, going to the uh, to talks at the DAR, at the Walters Art Gallery, Baltimore Museum of Art, Maryland Historical Society. And uh, samplers at that point just kind of took over my life. I, I was introduced to Gloria Seaman Allen. Uh, at the time, she was the uh, DAR um, museum curator. She was giving talks and uh, she and I uh, both looked at each other, and uh, after her talks, and she had a list of uh, maybe 13 known Maryland teachers of of needlework, and uh, only, we had a hand, uh, you know, maybe a couple dozen samplers we knew about that were made in Maryland. And this was the mid 90s, the first time we were talking about that, and. We met up in Annapolis at uh, one of the historical homes because uh, they invited us to come see their uh, quilt samples and their samplers. And she said, uh, and we're walking down Cobblestone Street down in Annapolis, uh, one beautiful October afternoon. And after seeing these gorgeous um, Baltimore uh, Baltimore quilts, uh, Baltimore album quilt, quilts and the samplers. And she said, Barb, why don't you write a book? I says, well, I'm not a, I'm not a, um, a woman of uh, words. Uh, I said I'd rather stitch my words, and, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so she, I said I think uh, you should write the book because she had written a couple of books already: one on Maryland uh, quilts, and then one on um, uh, genealogical samplers uh, in the DAR collection. And so I said, well, I'll tell you what: we'll start, <laughs> <laughs> and. Ten years later, we had a huge list. Oh. And that's, when, that's when her book came out in 2007, and we had uh, one of the she had one of the best exib sampler exhibits at the Maryland Historical Society. Just a fabulous uh, exhibit she put on, and uh, it was a it was a it's always been 
a great joy to work with her and and learn so much about the sampler teachers and makers in, in the great state of Maryland. So uh, we continued on with that, and we did uh, the book um, for the Washington, D.C. area, which encompassed Maryland again, but also Virginia and, and then D.C. There was some Navy schoolyard, um, Navy schoolyard, yeah, Navy yard school. And I'll get it all mixed up here, but they they, had, they produced quite a few um, wonderful samplers there, and so many other great schools. And the book that uh, we've been working on for the last few years is the Delaware Sampler book, which is due to be published this year. So there's an exhibit coming up. Uh, in June at the uh, Biggs Museum of Art in Dover, where there's going to be a symposium on the uh, 9th of June, and there's some uh, big-name lecturers going to be there. Mary Brooks from the Westtown Quaker School, and Anderson of the Sampler Archive, my library artist, Cindy, <laughs> <laughs> will be speaking, uh, and um, oh, there's a couple others get who now but it's going to be a great day and people can go to the uh bigs uh museum uh, website to find out more about that if they'd like to be part of that come and see that because yeah. it's it's um it's relatively inexpensive we were trying to get it uh down as low as possible and trying to get uh, a foundation to help pay for it and, and we did find and they did find a couple of foundations to help pay for it but uh it's it's a good deal if for, with lunch it's forty five dollars all day long. Oh. So I think that's a that's that's pretty good e ticket. So you uh, see that's the thing where you live that I think people in general in the rest of the country don't really understand is folks on the East Coast in general, but certainly in the New England and Northeast there on the Atlantic Seaboard, the the history. The early American history is is right there. You know, it's it's part of the fabric of your life, because that's the thing I love about Boston is, and, and I just I kill to get to Boston every chance I can because, you know, one building will be this this early American ancient thing, and right next to it, steel and glass. You know, mm -hmm. and and the history is just right there all the time, and and people have such a respect for it and such a desire to keep it alive and, and keep the awareness alive that it just, uh, uh, I, I don't see that anywhere else in the country. Uh, certainly not in the Midwest. I mean, there's you know, obviously an appreciation for the history, but, but you guys live it all the time. And when you talk about it, daughters of the American revolution, you know, that's, uh, I mean, that's a very real thing where you on the East coast there and, um, it's, it's just so neat. And then, and then you, when you're able to bring in samplers and the history of samplers, and and talk about the, the girls that were stitching them in America. Uh, it's just I, I just I just love it. I just think it's just great stuff, and it's great that it is staying alive today, and that you're able to learn through your research so much more about these girls, and 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 get that written down and get it shared with others. It's just uh, it's just a special thing, I think. Well, I I think samplers are speak to my heart. Because these girls, not every girl could be educated. Not every girl is allowed to go to school. Not every girl was afforded that, along with boys too, but more so let the girls less and boys. And uh, it's not necessarily that these girls were privileged. These girls were lucky to have parents that cared enough about them and would scrimp to save in some instances. Uh, scrimp to get pennies to send their, their children to school, um, laundresses. Uh, uh, this one story that uh, from the uh, Oblate School of uh, Sisters of uh, Providence in Baltimore, one of the girls that went there, her mother was a laundress uh, locally, and she didn't board at the school, but she walked to school every day, and she... Uh, her, her mother scraped pennies together to get her daughter to have an education and um, very important uh, anytime. Girls' history, very little is written about it. A sampler is a tangible thing, proof of a girl's, someone's importance of her education. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just, it's important to me to um, regard these girls, uh, give them respect. It's not just school work. They're, they're, they're works of art as far as I'm concerned. And um, I just, um, oh, have my heart on my sleeve sometimes when I think <laughs> about them. Because I, I have such respect for them. Yeah. And uh, from the simplest marking sampler to the highly skilled um, lace work, open work, uh, three-dimensional raised embroidery, just uh, the work that is involved is just phenomenal. And it is art. It's not just, um, I don't consider it folk art because the girls, a folk art is some, the artist is someone who, uh, was not trained, um, whereas these girls were trained. They went to school uh, for this, and the parents paid extra for them to learn how to do embroidery at these schools. Uh, a girl uh, that went to a boarding school, let's say, for example, it, it cost a couple hundred dollars for the full, whole week for her to go, including the boarding and her food and her books and her other materials she needed. Now, on top of that, she probably, her parents probably had to spend another two hundred dollars just for, for the, uh, for the silk, for the linens, and uh, the extra training just for to learn how to uh, do all those different types of embroidery. So that was on top of all the other things that she had to do. So, so, so a huge, so a huge financial commitment in a culture that really was male oriented. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yes. So that so. that really speaks to the parents as a couple and their commitment to, to their daughters, I mean, to their kids in general, but uh, that, that's a, yeah, that's a strong statement for that. Just in that uh, regard. Yeah. When did you start collecting samplers? I started collecting them about the time I started making a list with Gloria about Maryland samplers. <laughs> I... <laughs> uh Oh, uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> Cause, uh... I was, they were popping up <laughs> and I was uh, becoming more aware of them and, and uh, the different schools. And there was a local Annapolis uh, antique dealer and uh, he put uh, on all of his samples that they were all American and, and they were not. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there was one in particular I would go and look at. I just fell in love with her and I would take my friend, Deborah at the time and uh Anytime we were out and about doing them, we'd stop. I'd always have to stop at the antique shop to look at this one sampler. And she got tired of this, and she told my husband, "You need to buy this for it because I'm tired of going to see this sampler." <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so that was the first sampler um, that my husband bought me, and uh, it turned out to be. Uh, it was her, she was from England. She was not from. Uh, Bucks County, like this antique dealer said, because all you had to do is turn over the back side and it said exactly where the sampler was framed, which was in, um, I wanted to say Portsmouth or South, no, Southampton, England. <laughs> and then, of course, when I took it apart, it was definitely uh, uh, worked on an English uh, wool uh, fabric. It was oh. not. <laughs> <laughs> and it had a, uh, it had a little, uh, uh, dark green uh, mark along the selvage, which was a, a tax line that came from England, and that's how you could also tell that oh. that was uh, made. That that fabric was made in um, England. It's a rarity to find uh, English linen that was uh, brought over here, and then the girls, uh, made, American uh, girl, made her sampler here. It's we've found maybe two or three that I know of that way. Uh, normally, uh, the, uh, on average, that doesn't happen. <laughs> so I can't say it, it never happens because uh, it could. could happen more often, but not, not actually. So yeah. that's, a, that's, a, that's a giveaway on, on how to figure out uh, some of the antiques. But um, Now, you have, you have – uh, we've talked to several uh, sampler people – and I mean, I, you, you guys have all gotten me just, you just sucked me right into this thing. So it's all of your fault. You know, I just, I used to blame it on Nicola, but anymore, it's just all of you guys. It's just, just your fault. 
<laughs> I'm happy. I'm happy to enable. Yeah, I well, am, and I. <laughs> all of you are. So just. <laughs> but you you have because you have a lot of uh, in your collection and in your reproductions American samplers, and then you have some Mexican. I mean, you have an interesting mix. But I'm curious, are there characteristics of American samplers that make them different from European? Or are they just variations on the same theme? Or what? how does that work? There must be some, some differences. Well, some of the differences are what is, uh, okay, uh, the type of, uh, depends on the school depends on the religious content sometimes. Uh, most samplers will have some kind of religious content because the schools were uh, that they were attending were religious, whether it be a Catholic convent, a Quaker boarding school, or um, uh, a Dutch Lutheran school, uh, so, or, you know, um, Baptist school. It just depends on um, also... Who is trading with who? What countries are trading? You'll find uh, on my one uh, sampler from Colombia, uh, South America, it looks very French. And that's because there were French nuns teaching her in uh, Medellin, Colombia. Oh. And uh, oh. they were also doing trade with Germany. So you've got a little... You've got influence of several different uh, countries, and um, when I say trade, I'm talking, you know, uh, there, there were magazines being printed in different countries, so those were being traded back and forth. There were books being printed in different countries, and if you're trading with those countries, just like you see, for perfect example, uh, you take a Scottish sample that has uh, illuminated letters. And what I taught, they might have little curly cues, little circles around the letters and all the different corners. Mm -hmm. You will also find that probably originated from the Netherlands because you see that a lot in the, uh, in the, in the Northern. Uh, I'm working on one now that, oh my God, there's so many different highlights, <laughs> so many alphabets on this and they're all illuminated letters like that, different types. Mm hmm now, you see that also in America. Uh, I have one sampler, Mary Whitaker. I know she's from New England, and she's got all these different um, alphabets, the illuminated letters, and yet I couldn't tell you if she was uh, Dutch or English or Scottish. Uh, she could have been a little bit of each, but you follow those, all those um, alphabets and how they move from, let's say, Okay, the Netherlands to Scotland. Now they've come over to uh, America and they continue. They start in New England and they keep moving across into New York and into um, up Canada. It's it's amazing to watch how a motif travels and moves around and why how they each one influences hmm. each other. Uh, same with uh, Mexican samplers. Uh, certain things on Mexican samplers, um, I'm talking um, after uh, Columbus came, uh, they were doing a lot of um, trading with Germany. So you'll see a lot of uh, German uh, influence on their motifs. Oh. And uh, yeah, uh, so um, trade has a lot to do with it. It, 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 it does. Um, so, so in these days of, of uh, a, a global economy that we talk about, we really, really aren't any different than they were back then. It's just how fast we do it. And uh, to be honest, one of the things that moved trade a lot was embroidery, was silk, was was the trade of uh, of uh, clothing and fabric and that kind of thing. Um, that's not one of the number one things people wanted. Mm -hmm. well, at least the, the women did for sure, and uh, so that that makes a um, big impact, you know, early on. Yeah, yeah. So so you get so you start collecting these samplers. You're hooked on them and yeah. uh, stitching, and then uh, at some point you just say, "Wait a minute, I want to start reproducing." Or was that kind of <laughs> your plan? Well, no, <laughs> I had. had um, 
I had uh, wanted to start reproducing, and I did start reproducing one sampler from Annapolis in 1997, but I hurt my arm, and I got it uh, reproduced. I got it, the, uh, and uh, I hurt my arm, and I had to quit stitching, no kidding, for three years. <laughs> a lot of people know, a lot of people that know me know this story. So um, I had to put uh, Sarah Sands on hold. And uh, I was uh, moved out of the area for a couple of years and came back to this area and uh, got in contact with Gloria again and was helping her uh, with um, finding out about more Maryland samplers. And uh, it was actually Gloria that said, Barb, when are you going to get going? You have to do this. We're going to have this exhibit. We're going to be doing this. So Gloria and a few other friends said, Get out of the researching business and get going with your uh, <laughs> your sampler business. So uh, that's what I did. I started off in 2000. I started publishing in 2005 um, because uh, it, it, boy, it's hard to put yourself out there, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I did. I thought, okay, you know, what's the worst that can happen? You know, and then I'll buy it. It's okay. <laughs> Right. Now I don't like them, but uh, I started off with five uh, samplers: a, a Mexican, an American, and I forget what else. A couple other little things, and they took off and they did okay. So they um, and I put every time I uh, make any money, it just goes back into buying more samplers or you know <laughs> frames for the models or whatnot. And, so it all goes, all returns to more samplers. Just feed so. the meter. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It goes right back into it. So, so do you stitch all your models? I used to. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> and I still do for the most part. I've got a terrific guy, John Kazmaier, award-winning uh, sampler maker. He, uh, now he's, well, he's getting, he's, he's more of a senior citizen. And he has a bucket list, so he only does about one for me a year. But he used to do a couple, at least two or three. He was doing for a while for me, so Ooh, I that's could a machine. Out. <laughs> he, oh, he is, he is, because not only would he do my models, but then he would redo the the sampler to his uh, liking. And he likes to work on very high count. He'll work on the fifty two sixty, and he'll he'll change the colors and he'll just do what he, he and they're gorgeous what he does it just does a fabulous job but when i first met john he only did cross stitch and we finally got him to do so much more we being the he belongs to a group of stitchers and um we help him along but uh, <laughs> he was he was always he was on my case about you know getting my girls out faster and i said well john i can only stitch so far and so long and you know do you want to do some for me and then i heard from him a month later and he said yes <laughs> ah. <laughs> goodness so john does that um my husband stitches but he doesn't stitch my models in fact he hasn't really stitched at all in a little while he does other things oh. he has a lot of other hobbies <laughs> so yeah, I, I suppose I suppose that uh, in your house, yeah, eventually you'd feel pressured to at least try it. So, <laughs> well, he does. He, he's he's done a couple. He's done. He's completed two samplers, uh -huh. and on, on each one he says Jim's first sampler. He wrote it, and then the date, and then the second one he says Jim's second sampler. <laughs> <laughs> and so, the third one he's working on. He's been working on it. It's, it's got to be almost 10 years now, but um, he doesn't want to hear that, but he's going to hear it. Uh, and it's a blue uh, permit. It's got a bunch of sailboats on it because uh, he likes boats. Being a sailor, he tend to like sailboats. Uh, and uh, But he just hasn't felt like pick, picking it up in a while, so maybe I can get him to do it again. I don't know. He's got uh, he, He's done a lot of other things. So. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think for a lot of people, it comes and goes, uh, you know, the, the interest. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, for me, it, there were many years while we were raising kids where it went. Um, but it was it was always in the corner in a bag somewhere. But, um, uh, you know, kids, 
kids. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and then I would, uh, even if when I was working full time, I would try and have uh, at least a, a half hour in the morning or to stitch or after they went to sleep at night, I'd get at least a good hour in or something. Cause that was my therapy. That was, that was what calmed me down. <laughs> so I made a mistake. And then that wasn't such a calm part period. But... <laughs> yep. So, so, um, so you, you, some of your reproductions, if, if I read things correctly are ones that you own, but then you've also done reproductions from uh, other people's collections. Do you just, just. Yes. I, I have a couple friends that have collections and uh, they've allowed me to reproduce. I've also worked with museums, uh, reproducing some of their samplers when, when they allow me to do that. Yeah, how does, and, how does that work? Do they actually let you take the thing with them, with you? Well, oh, gosh, no. I yeah, go okay. in, I, I bring my silks with me, and I bring, my, uh, bring some fabric swatches, get an idea, and sometimes I just use uh, maybe some DMC cottons. I've got a bag of DMC cottons that are close to different fabric colors that I use on a regular basis from Lakeside Linens and from um, Zweigart Linens. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I have those DMC colors with me, not just the fabric uh, swatches. but So I'll take all this with me to the museum. I take a lot of photos. They allow they'll allow me to take photographs. Um, most of the time, they these pieces have been conserved at least to a mounting board, so I don't see the back side. Oh. I only see the front side. I wondered about uh, that. I wondered if you get a look at the back. Yeah, it it just depends. Sometimes they do have them, but uh, those aren't the ones that I have reproduced uh, that they've wanted me to reproduce. I've worked with the Maryland Historical Society, the Oblate Sisters of Providence in Maryland. Uh, there's a uh, Winchester. Um, Liddy Rhodes came from Virginia and Winchester. That uh, I can't. It's a county historical society where she's from. Mm -hmm. And uh, I forget. I know I'm missing a couple people. Um, Oh yes, locally there's the uh, my my county, my Queen Anne's County Historical Society wanted me to reproduce the sample that they have. Uh, but what was funny is sometimes you don't know what's on a sampler, even with the naked eye. I take these photographs and then I bring them home and I blow them up on my computer. So it's I have a, a laptop that I use for the photographs and then my larger screen I use for um, charting in this instance, and I'll blow up the photographs and all of a sudden something turns up that wasn't there before. Oh, let's that way. The naked eye didn't see this, this bird that was hiding in the clouds. <laughs> or, this, or and some, sometimes I find a name isn't what they think it was. Oh, so, Oh yeah. That's, that's a surprise too. Yeah. <laughs> Then we have to redo the complete history. Right, I was going to say, yeah, that just that just made everybody do a left turn there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we, we I figured it out, so it's all right. good one in the end. Yeah, but uh, what is what is the motivation for museums? Uh, the and if I'm asking questions that are none of my business, say so. But uh, what is the motivation for them having you reproduce? I mean, do do you? Does part of the sales go back to them, or do they just want it so that they can uh, share it with others? Twofold. Um, every time I work with a museum, they will always get a, a piece of the wholesale okay. from me directly, or I will give them a uh, a large a larger royalty, or they can we can do it each time or both. It depends on whatever they want. As long as if I can get permission, that's fine. Then they can sell the chart in their gift shop, mm. and and they they'll make you know money on top of that. Uh, usually, when uh, I'm allowed to do this or I've asked permission, it's in conjunction with a uh, sampler exhibit that they're having, and so people are coming in and they're looking for it. Hopefully, they'll put these on their uh, websites so that people can all around the world can can find it. However, with some of these smaller um, county uh, historical society, 
you've constantly got changing personnel. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> so the website is not always up to date and these things are not always, you know, there, but, and they're small, they're small little places, but uh, we do what we can. I'm working with another uh, county uh, to help uh, just south of me in Eastern Maryland, uh, Talbot County. We're trying to get their samplers um, conserved and uh, I've worked with them to help them uh learn more about their samplers and um, I've, I've given a couple of uh, lectures there and we're uh, drumming up some money to help them to get um, their their samplers conserved. I've, I've got a couple of uh, guilds I belong to and uh, we're just waiting to hear from the conservators as how much of it is. And uh, one of the things my guilds do uh, uh, is help pay for that kind of thing. Okay. So, so if there's a, um, uh, most of the guilds work on a uh, nonprofit, and when we have too much money in our accounts, we need to spend it mm-hmm. on something like that. So uh, we try to find uh, these smaller um, people that need, and even some of the big uh, m- museums need help, you know, with the cons- conservation of their samplers. So yeah. we're there to help. What, and they're good groups. What, go- what goes into that? Are, what goes into conservation? You're going to say it depends. But is it uh, generally just a cleaning or repair, or is it just getting it off of whatever it's mounted on because it's destroying okay. <laughs> the mounting is destroying it? What yeah. what generally do you run well, into? Well, repair is not uh, what we do anymore. Um, oh, right. It's it's not a matter of repairing; it's a matter of preserving. You don't want to change what is there. You just want to make sure it doesn't get any worse. You want to get it as clean as possible, and um, you don't want um, you don't want to hurt it in any way. Um, the conservators would um, a lot of times. So it depends on how the the, the, the condition, and uh, you don't want any glass touching it. You don't want any wood touching it or paper or cardboard you want uh conservation you want archival museum quality everything Mm -hmm. you don't want anything that uh is going to hurt that um my girls i've got two that are uh conserved and and framed most of my antiques are archival boxes some of them are mounted on archival mounting boards uh and i have layers of um bleached linen or a little bit heavier than that uh, not um, muslin heavier than muslin not linen in between them um i don't have too many on top of each other either uh, and i change out the uh linen i don't use the archival paper so much i do use some of it but you have to change that out every year uh so it's for me it's easier to just uh uh, clean the um, wash the uh, fabric that I put the unbleached fabric that I put between them to keep them out. Okay, wait back back up the truck here a little bit. So so acid free tissue paper should you should change that out every year. Yes, you should. Oh. If you've got yeah, if you've got uh, yeah, if you've got your wedding not your personal wedding dress, but if, if someone no. has a wedding dress, can't help you there. Stuff, no. <laughs> yeah, if, if they've got, if you're using archival paper, yeah, uh, you need to change that every year. Oh, because it, it loses its good quality. Oh, it's it's only good for so long. So, uh, the other thing is, um, let's see, I, I've got all my g- girls in archival boxes that aren't framed, laying flat. Uh, I wanted to buy a um, metal. Um, map chest that I could put them in, but I just don't have room in my house for it. <laughs> I, <didn't, laughs> it would, I mean, I, I could move out uh, one of the rooms and take over another room, but no, I just, at this time I just don't have that. And uh, it's hard to give, give my little girl, my girls up, <clears throat> but I know I'm going to have to um, uh, probably sell some just to keep going the business going. Yeah. But it's, it is, it is hard to part with them, you know, 
Oh, they're part sure. of the fam. Yeah, sure. <laughs> that's and that's something that there just seems to be the more I've been exposed to these samplers, there seems to be an endless supply of these things. Are is is that the case? I mean, are they constantly being well, discovered or are they just getting moved around enough that it seems like there's a lot of them? Well, they do get moved around. They, no doubt about it. They go from collection to collection, but more and more are being discovered all the time. Uh, I don't think we're ever uh, going to see them all. People mm. don't know what they have. Don't even, you know, a lot of times they're found in uh, furniture rolled up in uh, a, a drawer that no one knows about. Uh. Those are, those are the really good ones to find <laughs> yeah. that haven't seen the light of day in a long time. But, uh, you know, you, you find them all over the place. I find uh, them in shops and on uh, auctions. I find them online auctions, not necessarily just eBay, but, you know, auction houses like mm-hmm. uh, Sotheby's and uh, a few others. Uh, serious collectors, you need to know who uh, Amy Finkel is of samplings.com. Yes. Uh, and, and uh, well, the Hubers, too, have some. And uh, Ruth Van Tassel's in um, uh, Mar- just side of Chester uh, County. She's in Chester County. She has some nice samplers, too. A few other people, very good sampler people. But you got to be where, uh, you know, you've got to know what you're doing um, and uh, what to look for, too, if you're serious you're going to be, you know, going on uh, into the auction houses and looking. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I've, I've read enough to have a sense that you can really get taken if you, if you don't, if you're not wary and you don't know what you're doing, that uh, you can end up with something that's relatively worthless and pay a lot for it. Even, even those of us who have had some experience have been taken too. Uh, you know, a photograph if you're not sure ask for more photographs if if it's something online and if they're not willing to give you more photographs then you know don't deal with them walk away uh, uh, walk away walk away <laughs> walk away because uh yeah it, it's always buyer beware and um the uh it's better to be safe than sorry <laughs> so so do we have in your area do we it sounds like we have a community of collectors and when when something interesting goes up the word spreads like wildfire it does <laughs> <laughs> and if, if i can't if i do monitor ebay i monitor all uh, a lot of the online auctions because i'm looking for samplers not just to buy because uh, i really don't i I've, I've cut back quite a bit on what i was buying but unless something really cool comes along uh <laughs> but um <laughs> But for the most part, I still look daily, and it's for research purposes mostly. Uh-huh. And there are a lot of people that I'm looking for for certain things when I see them. And uh, other people I know are looking for certain types of samplers, and I'll let them know if something comes up. In other words, I like to spend other people's money. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, and there are times I also look at... Um, State sales throughout the country. Uh-huh. I've been able to find some import, a couple of important samplers that way, and if I can't physically go to one of these estate sales, I hopefully know someone in the area that will go and buy it for their uh-huh. collection. And if they don't want to buy it for their collection, I'll buy it from them. Um, it doesn't happen too often. They usually keep it. <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> I've been able to find some pretty pretty good deals for some people. Some very important uh, samplers have been found that way. Yeah. Uh, another, re- another good reason to uh, keep abreast on some of these uh, auctions is uh, one time I was able to help a museum find a lost sampler. Oh. That made that made me feel really proud. Yeah. Uh, one that had been missing from their collection for a long time. So we were able to uh, reconnect that with that museum. Oh, that's great! So, yeah, yeah, that 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 made my day. <laughs> so, so what? And we got oh, darn it, we got to wrap up. I hate this. Okay. We, no, we're, but we're not going to right now. 
what is what is it what is it that makes you just jump up and buy a sampler is there some something special about them that if one shows up uh, you just you can't resist it or does each one either have to speak to you or not speak to you they usually have to tell a story for me okay uh either uh, it either has to have some kind of a uh if it's from a special school um like I, last summer, I found one that I thought was Delaware, but it's actually Maryland. But it's the teacher that moved back and forth from Delaware and uh, uh, Maryland. And that was uh, the teacher was Mrs. Uh, Ann Barkley uh, Cloud. And um, the sampler I bought has, <clears throat> oh, just it's it's beautifully uh, freestyle embroidery with some sheep and some lots of flowers. Fruit, we're calling it, it's in the fruit and flower group so i ha- i had to have that one i just had to okay uh susanna spiro just came out this year and she tells a fabulous story of a village there's there's different houses there's a milkmaid there's some happy cows it's just it just spoke to me and I, and I had to have it um there's another designer that collects cows and i've and i've put cow samplers onto her well i told i've told her about them but this one had to come home to me because it was just, <laughs> <laughs> it was just so special. I had to have it. So, you know, it just, it, it, it has to speak to me some way. And, and I like a lot of the simple ones too. Uh, a very simple Quaker sampler by Sarah Comfort is so endearing. It's all one color. It has a couple of alphabets, her name, her parents, and her brothers and sisters. That's mm-hmm. all. Uh-huh. And that's all it really has to say. So that's a very sweet sampler too. Okay, one last question. We gotta go. What's what's the one sampler in your collection you'd never part with? Oh, that's that's pretty easy. That's Mary Reese, seventeen eighty five. Mary Reese? Mary Reese. R E E S E. And she's uh similar to a lot of uh she wasn't in Anne Marsh's school. But someone from Ann Marsh School of Philadelphia taught her. And uh, Ann Marsh's mother was Elizabeth Marsh. They came over in the 1720s to Philadelphia. And I think uh, some of the most spectacular samplers came from that school. So uh-huh. I'm, ha- I'm thrilled to have that one in my collection. Absolutely thrilled. Did you reproduce it? I did, yeah. Yeah. Uh, she came, she came down from a family of four samplers. Okay, I'm scrambling uh, through your site right now to see if I can find it. Yeah, uh, Mary Reese, and then also well Sarah Comfort, and the Elizabeth Borton and Lydia Borton. All four of those samplers were um, ascent, uh, descended into the same family. Oh, Mary and, Reese! Oh, I just found it. Holy smokes! Isn't she fabulous? Wow. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. Very special. Very special piece. <laughs> wow. So. That bottom band there with the. Exactly. And that bottom band's been around since the 1520s. Yeah. It's one of the first uh, bands that was uh, print uh, published and printed in the. Um, I forget either Denmark or Germany. I forget which, but yeah, 1520s is when that came out. So it's it's very uh, similar to another uh, fabulous uh, Quaker sampler. So this one's Quaker too. Uh, the Dorcas Haynes, which is in the Fitzwilliams. One of these days, I'm going to stitch that one. <laughs> I have I I have the chart. I have the silks. It's all ready to go. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh. Okay. All right. Well. I got to get the Mary Reese one. Wow, that's nice. Oh my. Yeah, I can see. Yeah, I I I can see why you wouldn't let that go. I assume but, the but, I assume the original's in in really good shape. No, she's not actually. Oh. And I have to tell you that this Mary Reese is an adaptation because all of the writing that was on the original was missing. Oh. So I put in prose that I thought was uh well, some of the um, some of the uh, the text is from other samplers from the same school, all right. Okay. And some of it is um, on a lot of it is uh, Quaker um, thoughts. Let's put it that way. Uh-huh. And it, it, it 
it all works together well. So I have to call it an adaptation because I couldn't figure out what it said. Yeah. So sorry about that. So but, all so all of the text was gone, but everything else was intact enough that you could reproduce it. Right. The only thing that was still there was her name because the text had been stitched in a um, a silk that was dyed with a walnut or um, um, and it just deteriorated. Uh -huh. It just yeah, it just fell apart. Oh. Uh, so uh, the things I you guys only... the things you guys get to learn doing these. Wow. So much I... fun. Okay. Well, it's been it's been a lot of fun talking to you and we yep. we should talk again. Oh we cause... will. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Barbara. Thanks so much. And thanks to everyone for listening. And uh, I hope Christine and I will be back on Wednesday. We're sure going to try. <laughs> <laughs>